In 1977, an author named Richard Bachman released his first novel. I'm going to put one of the covers on the screen with a bit of it blurred out for reasons that will make sense in about 30 seconds. Some of you know where this is going though. Bachman continued to write and had four books published until he was ceremoniously killed in 1985. Funnily enough, the same year I was born. I didn't kill him, yet he went on to write two more books after that, one released in 1996 and the final one in 2007. Richard Bachman's murderer was Stephen King. Stephen King is also the person who created him. It's one of the more famous instances of a pseudonym being used to write books, so congratulations on being one of the lucky few today if you didn't know this already. I think what makes it interesting to many people is that Stephen King was already a successful author before the Bachman books, although his enduring worldwide fame wasn't quite secured yet. The Shining was released in the same year as Bachman's first. King has been a bit all over the place with his reasoning for writing as Bachman, which to me probably means he just wanted to do it, goddammit, and why does he have to explain everything? But a couple of his reasonings stand out to me regardless, that these were works he had already completed, at least in part, and wanted to explore their ideas or release them with more freedom, that he wanted to see if he was capable of achieving success as a writer again without the easy mode win his name had become. And finally, that releasing too many books could hurt his reputation and standing, especially as far as his publisher was concerned, and this was a way to circumvent that restriction. This last one is particularly poignant considering how much shit King has gotten for writing so much, and that must be why his quality is so inconsistent, even though reality is far more complex than that, in my opinion. Many people also have this view that the longer there is between works being released, the more innate quality they must contain, which is why I release as few videos as possible. In any case, if you're only following along a little bit with his reasoning, you'd understand why he was pissed off when the Bachman is King reveal happened in the mid-80s. But that's the world of writing. For video games, I don't think this type of thing could occur, at least not with big budget titles that need dozens to hundreds of developers working on something. It doesn't seem plausible to me that a pseudonym developer could exist, or that one team could take planned but false ownership of a release to facilitate another team's or game director's reasonings that are in line with King's above. And yet, if there ever was a case for that happening, I think we have it here with Liza P. I absolutely do not think that another team secretly made this game. I just think that it feels so much like it that I would only be shocked that it was possible to pull off legally and logistically, and not because of the game's quality in any way. I loved this game, unless there's another surprise waiting for us in the last stretch of 2023, or that Baldur's Gate 3 really is all it's cracked up to be when I eventually get to it, then this will be my game of the year. And I played most of the big releases this cycle. I've beaten Lies of P five times, once on stream, then twice more on my own, and then two more times when taking a save file through New Game Plus. And I would still like to play it a few more times with different strategies, challenges, and weapons in mind. The only reason I stopped was because I couldn't lie to myself that I hadn't seen enough to make this video. If you are a fan of Souls Likes, then this is an easy strong recommendation for me to make that comes with only one warning and one caveat. The caveat first is that if you like to play these types of games more for the experiential side of them, then this might not be for you. It definitely has its own vibe and story to explore, but it doubles down on the combat bits of the genre more than it does anything else. And the warning I want to give is about that. The game presents its defensive options in a way that encourage a frustrating playstyle if you misunderstand a poorly worded tutorial early on and or if you focus on only one kind of response to enemy moves. Pointedly, this pop-up says you cannot dodge red attacks. This is only partially true. What it actually means is that you can't iframe through them with a dodge. You can still dodge out of range of the attack or if you learn the limitations of some red attacks that have a fixed direction or don't track you after a point in their telegraph, you can still dodge the right way to avoid damage. You just can't iframe through them. And doing that is definitely something you're going to want to do in addition to deflecting with well-timed blocks. A good goal to have in mind is to be doing an equal amount of dodging and blocking, not just one response for everything. Don't get me wrong, it's perfectly viable to do otherwise if you want, and most importantly, are having fun doing so. But if you're hitting a wall of difficulty and finding the game frustrating, it's likely that you're not diversifying your responses enough. If you're not going to find that fun, then, again, this game might not be for you. 
And that's it. Of course I'm still me so I have some criticism for the game which I will dispense shortly. But before that comes a spoiler warning cut off and before that is me repeating how much I adored this game. It's rare that I play something that so thoroughly exceeds my expectations and has me wondering where the hell it came from. Outer Wilds was another like that a few years back. I don't know how this team pulled this off so well on their first attempt at this type of game, one that has been attempted by so many other developers and almost always comes up short. I don't think this game is getting enough credit for what it does right. It's considered to be a good game. It's not a good game. It's a great game. DLC has already been announced, and I'm hopeful we get another game with a different letter next to Lies of in the title, because if this is where this series starts, then we're in for a treat if we go up from here. Anyway, review and intro part is over, spoiler warning on the screen, play it yourself, and then come back if you haven't already. I'm so happy to see you. Lies of P plays things quite safe and still manages to be full of surprises. Chief among them for me was how long the game was while upholding an incredibly high standard of quality. In the first area, the fundamentals felt quite good and the tutorial boss was a smooth conclusion to that. Everything about level navigation, healing, attacking, dodging, and blocking, etc. were taught fairly well. The intricacies of the combat and how far the game would build on it obviously weren't showing themselves yet, and so I moved on to the next level and was a little disappointed with how it repeated some more basic enemies in a straightforward area, like the tutorial was just extending out some more. And then I got to the first real boss, the Scrapped Watchman. After that fight, I was so impressed by what the game was doing that I was braced for it to abruptly end. The next area was where it would run out of steam. The next boss was going to be where it would all collapse, or the game would be so short because of how good it was so far that it would suddenly end when I reached the next bit. I went to every boss tense and resigned that this would be where the game would start to get bad, and I would have to say, Lies of P has a really good first third or first half and then it becomes a mess. Then before I knew it, I was watching the credits scroll by with that disappointment never manifesting. The cliff for quality never came, and there had been more than enough great boss fights to satisfy me. In fact, the last three at the end were some of the best. But this script is starting off drifting into a format that I often regret, where I dump all the things I like about a game at the beginning before pulling the criticism trigger and never letting go until I'm out of ammo. Even though I try to touch back on that positive stuff near the end, the final result is a video that is dominated by negativity for the bulk of its runtime, even if I liked the game. So instead, let's flip to the opposite here and start off with the biggest thing that Lies of P gets wrong, world and level design. And honestly, even this might be a good thing for some people, depending on what they're looking for. To me, Soulslikes have a generous helping of Metroidvanias in their DNA, because why wouldn't you want to mix two of the dumbest genre names together when talking about something? Lies of P, however, has lawful linear on its character sheet. There is only one optional side area in the game that you can discover, and it's quite short. Everything else is level then boss, level then boss, and then next level, and next boss. There is a fair amount of exploration to do within those levels for finding upgrades and weapons and the like, but even these detours are kept in the same sort of structure. Let's picture a square. We can plonk down a starting checkpoint near one of the corners and have a player character walk the path through the square until they get back to where they started. Right here will be a locked door or an elevator or a breakable wall and voila! The starting checkpoint is now exposed to either another square to walk along that links back here, or a straight line that eventually arrives at a new cluster of squares. This is the most basic form of this kind of shortcut based level design, and it's what Lies of P does over and over. Sometimes the square might have a couple extra turns so it's not much of a square anymore, but it's still a square in spirit, or there might be a square within a square as a side area that loops back in, but that's about it. Contrast that to the many scribbles with shortcuts that cross over from level to level and not just within their local area that you can see in some of the best designs in this genre, and I think the potential problem is made clear. 
Some levels like the Shopping Center Arcade and the Opera House do flirt with the idea of being mazes, but they're quite short. And hey, like I said, this can be a good thing. With combat being the focus, it can be refreshing to have a game that both focuses on something and allows you to focus on it too. But I'd be too in tune with Pinocchio if I didn't admit that the lack of exploration in the game was its most disappointing aspect for me, especially on the world design side because I like the thrill of discovering hidden areas, whole levels, side bosses, and the freedom to wander around. An example of this can be found in an event that I usually would have loved, when an elevator after a boss took me to a room and after stepping through the next door, I was unexpectedly right back in the main central hub as a surprising link back to where I had started hours earlier. Instead of feeling a sense of wonder and marveling at the tight world design, I felt like I was going through the motions, just being led from place to place and not having relevatory clicks as the map I was building in my head was filling in. With interconnectedness done right, this can make the world so engrossing and rewarding to study. In Lies of P, I just want to fight. So it's good that the combat is so excellent then. Let's generalize gameplay a bit for the next few points I want to make. In almost every game, you can narrow complexity down to either the player moveset or the engagements they are moving through. Most 2D platformers show this beautifully clearly because player options are kept quite low. You can move left or right, jump, maybe a speed increase or a dash or a wall jump, and unless you're Pizza Tower, that's usually about it outside of temporary power-ups. These games can still manage to have deep, rewarding gameplay because of how the game tests your ability to use these very focused sets of tools. If you zoom out and look at it then, you can see the simpler side of the game here on you, and then the far more complex side with everything that you are tasked to run, jump, and dash through. Nintendo has historically been incredible at this in my opinion, with so much intense iteration on level and encounter variety that I think most of us take it for granted. Souls-likes almost always share this format. The player character has more capabilities than your average platformer one, but it comes with a fair amount of inflexibility, and it's not that much more in how you can move, have committed inputs, and are limited to one or a few weapon sets at a time. It's a sharp focus on encounter variety that allowed this genre to even be established, taking that relatively simple bundle of grounded character options through many varied locations and constantly refreshing the player's experience with new enemy types and new bosses in new environments. Most Souls-likes that have been attempted so far have not understood how vital this is, or they did realize it throughout development and ran into the arguably bigger issue of budgetary constraints. Always having fresh sets of enemies, even when recycling bits and pieces from earlier ones, requires a ton of resources, which requires a ton of money. If you can't achieve it, then even if you absolutely nail the game feel part of the combat, which is already a difficult task, you are left with a game that has that relatively simple player character moving through a mostly samey world in overly large levels to get more use out of those assets while fighting the same enemies over and over and over. If you've played a lot of games in this genre, then I am certain the names of some titles popped into your head as I said that last sentence. Bringing it back to 2D platformers, imagine how much lesser an experience Celeste would be if it wasn't always introducing new toys to the mix with each new chapter. This constrained but carefully calculated spread of variety would instead be the same two or three level gadgets copy and pasted onto slightly different backgrounds. Celeste is a great example of how this can be done successfully, and you can avoid this problem of too much repetition, but it could also be turned into a way to undermine my point here because of how much hidden complexity there ends up being on the player options. Lies of P is the only 3D Souls-like I've played that wasn't made by you-know-who, that has demonstrated an understanding of this and then made good on it. That made me feel like they knew how instrumental it was for being able to provide a gameplay experience with variety and depth in this genre. Not only that, Lies of P has two more additional qualities related to this that push the game even further. First off, the impressiveness of enemy variety here cannot be overstated. There are only a few smaller levels which do not introduce something new to fight. Even the last level is still adding new enemies, variants, and a remixed mini-boss. The opera has these Lady Marie marionette spider robots that look awesome, have their own sets of moves that require some strategic thinking in addition to creating a difficult problem of buffing the smaller robots around them, and they are entirely unique to this location. There is this kind of exceptional use of controlled variety like this throughout the game. 
On paper, every enemy should be added to a pool as they are introduced and then they all keep coming back to maximize variety for the rest of the game. Instead, the importance of having memorable encounters with enemies and some unique mini-bosses was prioritized like this to give the game a sense of flowing through new ideas and fresh problems, your first time through and every other time after that as well. The three enemy factions present in the game help with this immensely. This is a method that has been understood for decades now. You can go back to Half-Life 1 and the first Halo to see excellent examples of how a game can stay engaging by flipping back and forth between different groupings of enemies. This is the alien level, this is the human level, and when you're getting tired of one, it's time to switch between them. It's especially well done if there's some bleeding between the two when it is time to switch, and that's something new that they can do, or a whole ass new type of guy to fight belonging to that faction is added on each swap. Lies of P does this with puppets and carcasses, with a peppering of a few human fights and bosses throughout, and then allows them to mix together toward the end to create something new. This starts off a touch too slowly with the first two levels having similar kind of puppets, but once you reach Vanini's factory, it's amazing to me how the pacing of new stuff being thrown at you never lets up. The part after this is where you fight your first carcass set, and I think it was a stroke of genius to have the two larger main factions be a type of entity that is so modular, or so easy to accept a high amount of variance in their designs. This allows visual differences to be all over the game with robots missing parts and carcasses mutating in different directions, but still being functionally the same core enemy. I think a lesser game would have used this as an excuse to reuse assets without adding anything new, but here we see it being embraced and exploited for new gameplay challenges that also fit so well with the theming of these enemies. It makes sense that some special broken robots would move erratically and attack differently, maybe even stiffly and awkwardly as a way to tweak telegraphs to add extra challenge. It makes sense that some carcasses would evolve in a unique direction now and then instead of following a common trend and are therefore, quite literally, the only time you will fight one like it in the game. And just like broken or unfinished robots missing functionality and becoming a slightly different fight, you can find some carcasses that are at different stages of evolution before they're done yet, or in a process of effective puberty that still somehow looks better than mine was, and have a different mix of the same ingredients as an opponent for a different fight. My absolute favorite example of this type of thing in the game, which will probably go down as one of my favorite enemy designs of all time because of it, is found when the carcasses start possessing puppets and both flavors of enemies are churned together. This elite enemy here, which is one of the first you can fight in the game, comes back at the end with a writhing mass for a head that incorporates its own flailing combos onto the foundation provided by the puppets. And it's not good enough for me to point out how clever of a reuse this is, one that once again is perfectly smashing the themes of both enemies together to create something almost entirely new. Now why I love this enemy design so much is that it shows such a strong grasp on what makes combat in Lies of P tick, because all of the added extensions and extra whipping attacks this enemy now does make the fight much harder and more suitable for its placement as an endgame enemy. But they also double up functionality as opportunities to perfectly deflect more, similarly rewarding your commitment to getting better at this core gameplay mechanic as you approach the end of the game, and can therefore stagger and execute your enemy faster. It is firing on all cylinders for adding variety, difficulty, and a chance to get into a great flow state with the game's combat and dunk on an opponent, and also rewards you for engaging with the game's core system. It's not just a harder fight, it's a better and more dynamic one. Which brings us to the other quality of the game that capitalizes on how much variety is on offer here and a way to link this back to Celeste. I said a moment ago that it was a game that could be used to partly go against the standard I think most 2D platformers follow by having layers of hidden interactions and movement tech at the player's disposal, which is right there from the start but you just didn't know it yet which means there is substantial complexity on the player's side after all. This was the biggest surprise Lies of P had for me, and after having just explained how the game is so special for clearly understanding how crucial encounter variety is to enable fun from a simpler set of player options, I hope you can also understand how it remains so surprising. Because nailing enemy variety wasn't enough apparently, the game also needed to greatly expand what the player is typically capable of in these types of games as well to double down the investment in its combat system. There's a lot to unpack here, and on an individual basis, each piece doesn't mean much on its own, so bear with me while I disassemble and reassemble for the next little while. 
Getting the obvious one out of the way first, elevating the block function to have a much tighter and higher risk versus reward timing test is fantastic. These types of games often struggle with having enough ways to respond to enemy attacks. While blocking being the training wheels that you eventually take off for dodging can initially be thrilling, especially when you're in the middle of that transition, soon you're pressing one button all the time, and you can't go back to pressing two because now blocking is too easy. In Lies of P, you can still hold block for that easy damage mitigation, but with practice, this can be timed to rival the effectiveness of iframe dodging and in many cases, surpasses it. An easy trap to fall into here, or at least it's one that I fell into, was thinking that deflecting was the primary way I should be dealing with bosses. I don't mind that I made this mistake because I was still having fun trying to figure out all the timings on many long combos, but I can vividly imagine someone making the same error and not having a good time, on Romeo's long-ass combo especially. In both cases, the incredible dynamic difficulty system that the game has will be going unappreciated. In fact, I didn't grasp how good this was until I did my second playthrough with the self-imposed challenge of not deflecting unless I absolutely had to. Most bosses, but not all, were significantly easier when approached this way. Having multiple viable responses baked into the core player moveset allows for experimentation both in the long term and short term as you try to conquer bosses. Some enemy combo strings, again like Romeo's long series after igniting his scythe, show how drastic a difference in difficulty can come from said experimentation. In fact, this whole fight is the perfect way to show how easy dodging can be compared to the nightmare mode of trying to deflect it all. And fights like the clown puppet show the opposite, where you will be miserable without deflecting and feel like a king when you can parry it all. But these are the extremes that sit on opposite ends and sandwich most fights, being a proactive puzzle for every player to figure out. Do I like dodging this part or deflecting? Do I want to try and commit to getting the timing down for parrying this red attack or try to dodge away from it or some other positioning trick instead? The beautiful thing here is that some attacks will click for different players in different ways, and so the easy way and the hard way might be different for every player. And just because some boss attacks can be punished far more with a dodge doesn't mean that every player will find that more fun than continuing a streak of perfect parries into staggering the boss. And so within all this decision making and flexibility comes the realized potential of players being able to naturally settle on an approach to difficulty that works for them, with room for trying more dangerous but skillfully rewarding methods on later playthroughs. Difficulty in games is almost always going to be about compromise. I think this becomes more true as you play more games and learn more about your own skill and limitations, and most importantly, what kind of gameplay that you find fun even when it is brutally difficult. For some people, that means using every tool available to them, no matter what. For others, it can be a frustrating guessing game of difficulty selection modes and consumables and trying to get a balanced playstyle or a build that's capable but not a powerhouse that will trivialize your first time going through encounters. That Lies of Peace so phenomenally enables players to naturally calibrate the challenge level they are going for without obtrusive menu selections or the patronizing feeling that you've had to resort to an easy mode is probably my favorite thing that it does, and is why I replayed it so many times with different approaches and weapons. Said another way, I think it's incredible that a player can decide to not commit to learning how to fully deflect some of the hardest combos on a boss until another playthrough, and still have an awesome time and that strong feeling that they overcame a worthwhile challenge with the easier method they went with instead, one that still engaged with all of the game's major systems. It really feels like so much thought went into these fights with the specific intent of how can we make players want to engage with them in a fun way instead of just demanding that they do and then throw them a pitiable easy mode if they can't handle it. Lies of P can be shockingly difficult or surprisingly easy depending on how you tackle it, but if you're meshing with it well and working with it to find the fun, I think it's one of the best experiences out there for a challenge without being crushing, with room for growth after that. I think there's more to the intended experiential side to these bosses though, and just in case it's not already clear, I think these big fights are the highlight of the game. These are long, eventful encounters with tons of moveset variety. Most of the main bosses in this game could be the final boss in a lesser game. There are mini bosses sprinkled throughout levels, some of which don't even get nameplate health bars, that are more complex and rewarding fights than some fully featured boss fights in other Souls-likes. And I think this level of frankly 
opulent quality in its encounter design is born from having such a strong idea in mind for what these fights should be, and what fights in this game could be, and how the combat system could be explored as the player interacts with them, purposefully for an intended experience instead of fights being there just to fill up space. The Repair Tool, Healing Charges, and Stagger Bar are an essential part of this. Because I was engaging with every boss fight and trying to overcome it in a fun way instead of the easiest way, most of them ended with me on the ropes and seeing victory after an immensely satisfying comeback moment. The systems working together here facilitate this wonderfully, a feeling of tenseness in combat, dealing you with determination as things go wrong, or testing you with panic even if things are going well. This is what I meant by the individual pieces not sounding like much on their own. Like, just listen to this as a list. 1. When you're out of healing, one charge will refill as you deal damage to enemies. 2. Your weapon takes durability damage on hits and blocks, and needs to be periodically repaired or it'll break. 3. Deflecting enemy attacks will build up posture damage on them which, when full, will make their health bar glow. You have to hit them with a charged heavy or fable attack when they are in this state in order to knock them down for free hits and high damage. These sound like minor additions added for a bit of flavor to this type of combat system, and yet when combined with all the rest that Liza P offers, they allow some amazing moments of unscripted gameplay to emerge. I've beaten so many bosses with all of my healing charges gone and fueled by sheer willpower and or spite because I had finally gotten the enemy this low for the first time, managed to earn a charge back, top my health off, and then earn another charge again after barely holding on. This could have so easily been a system that lets you charge all your healing back when you deal damage, but no, the choice was made for it to just be the last charge so you are comfortable, but getting increasingly more tense as you use them all, and then when you're down to your last one, you are always agonizingly flipping between despair and hope, and always thinking there's a chance to pull victory off. The enemy health bar flashes and you feel both the rush of opportunity and panic, which can lead you to executing a hit that turns the fight in your favor, or baits you into a risky play and you die. Seeing and hearing your weapon bounce off the boss and you realize, oh shit, you can't press any advantages until you back off and find a safe moment to repair, or you risk attacking anyway if you're so close to victory. I beat a boss on my first playthrough with all three of these things happening, and it's one of the most memorable kills I've had with the genre. Holy shit! Holy shit! What a kill! What the fuck? What a kill! And then of course, as you gain more mastery with the game, you have the satisfaction of keeping your health high, weapon repaired, and expertly timing charged hits to knock enemies down. Because this is also a part of the challenge level that you can press against. They can start off as diversions to the game's flow state, and then later become amplifications. I'm reading this script back as I return to write more of it, which is a usual part of my process, and I'm a little embarrassed at how much I'm praising it, and I'm even more embarrassed when I'm recording it now. I hope it's not coming across as fanboyish, especially since I'm not done going over the things I liked, including a cherry on top that makes New Game Plus runs so attractive. I want to temper this all with some criticism, but apart from the level and world structure I spoke about earlier, there isn't much on the gameplay side that I can find a flaw with. I can think of ways that expansions could happen, like choosing one of the Legion arms to become a core part of the moveset and building counters around that, the hookshot would probably be the best one, but that's not a flaw, it's wishlisting for a future game, because there's already enough here. The boss roster is close to immaculate, but there are some misses I can point out among them. The biggest two for me were Fuoko and the Rabbit Brotherhood. Fuoko being the boss name that I think most people will forget, it's also very hard for me to say, which makes sense because it's also the most forgettable on the gameplay side too. It's the only boss fight that comes across as unfinished, which isn't something I would say if it was the first real boss, because that feeling comes from a slowness in its combos and awkward gaps in the fight after Scraft Watchman was just constantly in your space and demanding full attention as the boss right before this. Maybe Fioko is meant to feel like an older model robot that's more plodding, methodical, and hard-hitting, but even on later playthroughs I still think there's something missing from this fight. And not in a way that makes it too easy, just not as engaging as the others. The fight is actually still kind of difficult to me, there's something weird about the timings on it that I'm never comfortable with. So maybe that's the point, but hey, I don't know. Unscripted moment back again, hey, how's it going? 
On the other hand, the Rabbit Brotherhood feels like a finish fight, but it's not one that I enjoy enough to have to do twice on each playthrough. The way the rematch mirrors the first one is something that appeals to me on a meta level. The first time you start off against the big guy and clear out the smaller ones as you go, whereas on round 2 you have all the smaller ones up front and then end with just the big guy. But admiring that switch up doesn't carry over to the fight just not being very much fun for me. I think the first version works best because the rotating guest star gives you something new to work with, and the big rabbit becomes less aggressive when they come down so it's less likely to become an unfair staggerfest on you as their attacks overlap. Gank fights in the genre are usually pretty bad and this one avoids all those pitfalls and ends up being quite enjoyable, but the second round has you score off against them in the same way and their movesets just aren't interesting enough for this to feel like a good time before the real fight starts against the big guy, who is only a little different this time. It would have been a lot more work, but having the three smaller rabbits fight you in a more coordinated way, but still fair, would have made this fight have more of an identity, something like how the Mantis Lords work together in Hollow Knight, but now I'm asking for an entirely new fight instead of what we got, and we all know from how many bad multiple boss fights we've seen in this genre that I'm asking for a lot here. As it stands, these are the only two main bosses that I don't look forward to fighting when I'm going through the game, Fuoko and Rabbit Round 2. If we're bringing mini bosses into the mix, then I would add only two more, which are the White Lady and the gimmicky Gatekeeper near the end. The latter of which might have been okay if it weren't for the status debuff Shock having its effect become active immediately and not when the bar completely fills from multiple inflictions. Shock tanks your stamina recovery, which means you have to wait so much longer between attacking and evading, and the fight isn't really built around this slower pace if you make the mistake of taking a single hit. It just sucks. Way too punishing. This may sound melodramatic, but I don't think these kinds of anti-fun debuffs have any place in any game, or at least I've yet to see a usage of them that I think made my experience more difficult in an interesting or a fun way. As for the White Lady, she can enter a stance in which she will parry your next attack and, unfortunately, she is able to do this so quickly that it can come right before your attack lands but after you committed to it with the button press, so it doesn't appear like she has activated that mode until it's too late. She can deflect even charged heavy attacks like this and while I'm sure there must be some way to figure out when she is going to do it, I don't have the patience for it and ended up backstabbing her instead, which made the fight pretty boring. But if you like figuring out that kind of AI decision making and exploiting it, then this could be a good one for you. I personally don't find that fun in pretty much any game. But that's all, just those four. Every other main boss is a fight I look forward to and was eager to see how much my chosen weapon and playstyle would feel against them. And this is where I have a few more things to add on to the pile of Lies of P features that synergize so well. This game has new weapons to find as rewards for exploration like Breath of the Wild has Korok Seeds. They are everywhere, and it has more great bosses to use them against than Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom put together, which means it has more than three. New weapons is underselling it though, because this game allows you to separate handles and blades and mix them as you see fit. The handle brings the moveset and the blade brings the damage type and affects the speed and reach of the attacks. Aside from the special boss ergo soul weapons, every handle and blade you find can be rearranged like this, whether the result is putting the longest blade on the longest handle or as silly as a hammerhead on a small stabbing hilt. Some blades and handles work better together than others, because there will be a damage type penalty if, understandably, you try to thrust something that doesn't have a sharp point, but the game will still let you use it regardless of whether the moveset matches the blade, because it's all about variety and freedom, and I wonder sometimes if they should have even dropped that limitation so every set and combination could have been viable. As it is now, there are already no stat requirements to use any of these, just stats providing scaling on the damage type, and upgrades on blades carry over if you attach it on a different handle later. No other game has made me stop and experiment with weapons like this before, since it's so easy to use and embraces the mad ideas you might have. Putting the largest axe head on a teeny tiny butcher knife handle is not just fun, it's absurdly powerful. It does a lot of damage, has a great charged R2, and is really good at blocking if you're trying to fish out deflections. My favorite was putting the greatsword blade that you get at the very start of the game on the salamander dagger handle that you get in the third area of the game and creating a high block sword with a poke for enclosed areas, and a very fast charged heavy for breaking posture bars. This weapon system is an important part of why I think the repair tool works, because looked at in isolation, it's a bit of unnecessary busy work to be grinding your weapon bar back to full as you're slashing through areas. But since the game lets you tinker around like a weaponsmith, 
and also lets you break enemy weapons by deflecting enough, which as a quick aside is something you can do on phase one of some bosses to make the whole fight easier because the weapon stays broken when you go into the next phase, which is something you can figure out yourself by the way. I think it's a good thematic fit that you also have to do some basic weapon maintenance even without the fun moments it can bring to combat. Plus, the game also lets you combine the grindstone with a temporary weapon buff that you can cater to each fight if you want a bonus. And your weapon can never break completely, and you need to go and find another one somewhere. Changing weapons and handles is yet another way the game allows you to experiment with finding your own path to enjoyable difficulty. And again, it's not with using a busted magic system that breaks enemy AI so bad that they don't know how to respond to it, it's with thinking about what you want out of your weapon to suit your approach and still engaging with the game without having to break it, or without giving up your weapon or moveset entirely if you swap out just part of it over. Boss fights were built for and around this as well, and were designed more freely knowing that players had so many options and responses. A boss can have an attack pattern that hard locks them onto the player and unleashes a flurry of strikes that goes on for several seconds. And even if the player is using the slowest, heaviest weapon in the game that can't weave hits throughout it all, they can still block and deflect and be actively responding instead of waiting for their turn. Or the boss can go airborne and attack from afar, and you can deflect the projectiles back instead of having to play Simon Says Dodge Roll and wait for them to land so it's your turn to attack. Over my playthroughs, I had differing experiences with the faster and slower weapons like this. It was fun to dodge and slip in hits with quick stabs in the middle of an enemy combo when I was using a light weapon, but it was also fun on the next run to stand like a juggernaut deflecting it all and then knocking the boss down with two punishing hits since I could learn the best timing to do so with this different approach. Or I could do a mix of both with a weapon balanced somewhere in the middle that I made myself out of all of these options. Which means I can even make sure that it looks cool. The katana on top of all this was the Two Dragon Sword, which is a boss weapon you get near the end of the game and has rocketed up to being one of my favorite New Game Plus tools of all time. If you invest into learning this game's combat, then this sword is waiting for you to go even further, beyond. The best thing about it though is that it's like being able to play the game again for the first time, because its heavy R2 is both a charged attack and a harder deflection timing with a much higher reward. So if you're feeling like you've got the regular version down with all the deflection timings, prove how far you can take it with this sword that feels so damn good to counter bosses with. In fact, it can be kind of broken and overpowered after you get used to it. It's like that remade puppet enemy I spoke about earlier melted down and forged into a weapon set. It's more difficult, but if you know what you're doing, it's much more powerful. And then, like they're just showing off, the fable art on this thing has a dodge built into the first stage of the attack so you can use it to iframe a boss move and then land your fable art immediately in the opening you just made afterward. So it's not even a weapon that's built for deflecting either. You get to engage with both of the main types of responses in the game. This isn't the only way the game is prepared to make doing New Game Plus runs more fun. I haven't spoken about the upgrade system yet because it's called the P-Organ, and I thought if I said it too early, people who hadn't played the game might turn the video off. It really is called that. I hate boring upgrade systems. I'm playing a bit of Starfield right now, and it's just painful how dull many of the incremental upgrade tiers are in that game for leveling up. I think there's also a meme about getting plus 5 poison resistance on gear and how inconsequential that is. I think this problem arises from two places. The first being that a progression system is being used as a supplementation for gameplay having depth that you can get better at, so instead just keep leveling up and get a tiny treat. Don't you feel like you're getting better? And the second being a lack of understanding on what makes gameplay fun in their own game and what kind of changes could be used to add something worthwhile or to twist a mechanic into something else. As I've tried to demonstrate throughout this video, Lies of P deeply understands its own combat system, which is sadly not as common as it should be in games. I don't think that the developers here are super geniuses that are just continually making banger decision after banger decision, it's that they had a strong grasp on their P organ and what makes it work, which informed all decisions made after that. There's no doubt that some very smart people made this game, but this is more of a well-laid foundation that I'm talking about here. 
These upgrades work by finding a material called quartz in the world and slotting a smaller upgrade to earn a bigger one. This would have made the smaller ones being incremental an acceptable compromise, but nah, even some of these are as impactful as a whole new healing charge, extra ergo on killing an enemy, and you can flip through them to see how they have their hands in every gameplay system. Not all of them are amazing, but there's nothing here that's plus 5 poison resistance. The bigger ones though range from substantial gameplay tweaks to fundamental changes, as in you can now block red attacks instead of having to deflect them. However, you can only get that in New Game Plus, because for the first two cycles of that, New Game Plus 1 and New Game Plus 2, the game adds new tiers onto these to continually reward exploring for more quartz and had the confidence to think, hey, you've already beaten the game, so to hell with it, let's have some fun. Deflections repair your weapon now, have another legion arm equipped at the same time, here's a huge boost to your equipable weight limit, and why not have another amulet slot? Amulets are this game's version of rings and they benefit from the same philosophy as the P-Organ. The best of these come from boss Ergo Souls and are as powerful as being able to dodge even when you're out of stamina or being able to iframe red attacks now after all. Because a 50-50 chance to deal extra lightning damage to burning enemies on Tuesday mornings if the sun is being obscured by a cloud and you have to roll higher than a 10 on a d12 and the extra damage is 1 or 2 depending on how much higher you rolled above 10 is shit game design. Liza P wants you to have fun and wish for more amulet slots and be happy when you find quartz for all these cool things instead of slotting the one essential one on and then filling the rest for the situational sake of it. Anyway, that's close to everything I have to say about Lies of P. I want to wind this video down by addressing some of the criticism I've seen about the game, returning to some that I'm providing myself, and then commemorate one last thing that's a little out of my comfort zone. The biggest problems I've heard that people have with this game are how dodges work, the parry timing, and the cube, which is related to how you summon a helpful NPC for boss fights and then give it buffs. I actually agree with most of these criticisms. I didn't play around with the cube much, but it looked very clunky and oddly tied to an in-game timer to get resources to use it. I'm guessing the intent here is that if a player is going to be accumulating consumables and trying to gain an edge on fights like that, then this is a way to get powerful buffs while doing some consumable farming, which is a guaranteed way to get rewards, while also allowing them to build up a supply when they're between boss fights. In practice though, having to teleport back to the hub to get this stuff is annoying, as is having to come back here to level up, and I've read the buffs and summons aren't particularly powerful either. I only used it once on one fight in New Game Plus to see how it worked, so I can't say for sure, but I don't think this is a good system. Parry timings are harder to judge. I'm fairly certain that there are a few attacks in the game that don't work properly for getting a deflection. I feel this way because there are some very hard enemies that I got very comfortable deflecting and some odd ones here and there at the beginning of the game that I just cannot reach consistency on no matter how many times I see them. This could be a skill issue, and I strongly encourage you to think that because I don't have the time to rigorously test it, but I still wanted to float the possibility and this might be where some of the criticism is coming from. But this isn't the whole story for some people, and I've read complaints that the deflection window is too tight, period. I like how it is now, but I could live with it being a little easier, like maybe a couple frames, or far better, there being an amulet you find early on that could make the timing a hair more generous. Getting the iframes on dodging is much easier than deflecting, which is fine to differentiate them, and also one is more rewarding than the other, but with the cost of an amulet, maybe they could be brought closer together. Which brings us to the dodge problems, that you can't roll from the floor after being knocked down until you buy the P-Organ upgrade for it, and that dodging just feels weird and bad, yo. Well, while I do agree that dodging out of a knockdown state should be a part of the core package, there are plenty of games, maybe even one of your favorites in this genre, that lock an essential part of its combat system behind an unlock. The recovery roll isn't on the first tier however, and it doesn't feel fun to be knocked down, and you can't get up again, shovel guy always gonna keep you down. That said, it is rare that enemies will hit you after knocking you down, and for some fights this recovery move ends up being quite powerful since it's free time to heal or attack as the boss just stands there looking at you. Ultimately though, I agree that it should have been a part of the base game. And here I am adding this line from the future to say they've now updated the game to change this, so yay, even the developers agreed. It's wild seeing a Souls like be majorly updated from feedback like that, huh? Really throws a wrench into the idea that this was a pseudonym developer. This is definitely someone new that we're not used to. The dodge feeling weird, however, is something I vehemently disagree with. 
when I did my 99% dodge run, not only did dodging through attacks feel natural and smooth, I did it all without buying the link dodge upgrade. So maybe that upgrade makes it weird and everyone was just picking it. I don't know. There was never a single point that I thought the dodging wasn't functioning exactly like I wanted it to. It's also how I learned that the game has excellent hitboxes, with only a few standing out as troublesome like this one here on the last boss. I don't really know what to say here other than I disagree because I don't understand the issue, but I still think it's important to push back against it because it's fine. I wouldn't mention it if I didn't see it in so many discussions that took place after the game came out, which makes me think there must be something wrong about it that I'm not seeing, but for the life of me, I can't get there. Every fight in the game except for Mad Clown and Laxasia and Big Bunny Bro was significantly easier with a focus on dodging, so maybe too many people were still trying to dodge red attacks and getting frustrated? I don't know. Skill issue. Get good. Don't be a scrub. You don't understand the game. See viewers, I can do it too. Moving on, I want to touch back on the level design comments now that we've had a thorough look at the game. There's a part in Vanini's factory in which you walk through a big pipe and fight some enemies in a sewage swamp canyon. It wasn't until my third time through that I realized that this is directly below the bridge that you cross on your way into entering the factory. And what could have been a connection checking off in my head was instead a vague side area that could have been anywhere or anything. This could have been floating in some false dimension for how much it slotted in my head with the rest of the area. A ladder at the end of this canyon which you could climb to reach a small secret side path that opened a gate or kicked down a path back to the village staging ground before the factory would have been the only thing necessary to tie this level back into a neat little bow and make you feel like you're exploring as well as fighting. I don't want to harp on about this any more than I already have, but I sincerely hope that improvements to the level design in this way are made in whatever comes next from this developer. Having an expansive freeform world design might be too lofty a goal, but work like this within levels and the odd thread going back to an old level or an optional area now and then can go a long way, and it is, in my opinion, the only area of gameplay that is considerably lacking in Lies of P today. Which brings us finally, and awkwardly, to the last thing I want to speak about. Something I have no business trying to judge because I have no visual artistic talent whatsoever. And I wish I did, but I don't. Even here though, I think there's a gradient on what's acceptable. I think the game looks great, it runs well, and the enemies and bosses show a high amount of diversity in their designs. While other games have same boss type, just a bit bigger, and a different color fatigue as you move through them, Liza P remained fresh in its bosses for its duration. So far I think everything I've said is fair and supported by visual examples. I've been showing the game throughout the video after all. But I want to be more specific than that and I want to be upfront that I don't have the knowledge to do so. Yet I was so impressed by this part of the game that I am breaking my rule about only saying things that I can reasonably support. And I am talking about the animation work, particularly again on bosses. Because this isn't just about looking great, it also translated into a gameplay benefit. I don't think I've ever seen bosses move this well and naturally flow from different states and link different attacks together in such a readable way before. I often found myself able to intuitively feel that a boss wasn't done attacking yet and was continuing with an optional extension or chaining into a different pattern instead of returning to neutral. I was able to sight read some complex attacks and parry them the very first time I saw them. And apart from guessing that certain states and animation frames were being held longer, or a tremendous amount of work was done to include transition frames between many attacks instead of having sudden snaps from one to the next, I have no clue why it works so well. I just know that it does, and it was another way bossing in this game was so enjoyable, and the fights still look amazing and have so much variety so it wasn't at the cost of anything either. I hope there's a breakdown about how this works made by someone with an animation background in the future, or a dev talk directly about their process, because who knows, maybe this is the most impressive thing the game does after all, and I'm too ignorant to realize it. And that is it. As always, I could say more, but I'm trying not to. Still longer than I intended to be, but that's just how I am at this point. I love this game. I hope this was good enough to explain why, and that I did the game justice. Nameless Puppet Best Fight, the last area dragged a bit, I enjoyed the Pinocchio theme more than I expected, the Jumping Hug Puppet is bullshit, the arcade is the best level, Gemini was annoying, the links to other literary works like Dorian Gray and Wizard of Oz were awesome, and with that, I eagerly look forward to whatever is next in the lies of IP. Close your eyes, thank you for watching.